A very good evening and a warm welcome to all the listeners and viewers to another brand new episode of the Extended Panel. Joining us today, we have St Kilda AFL player and former Kilkenny All-Ireland minor hurling winning captain, Dara Joyce. Dara, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks very much, lads. Um, yeah, looking forward to the chat. So. And uh, also joining me this morning, I have colleague of the Extended Panel, Jimmy Maher. Jimmy, I, I know you're really looking forward to the interview with, uh, with Dara. Uh, yeah, Shooks, absolutely. Uh, delighted to have Dara on the show today. Uh, really looking forward to getting an insight, uh, I suppose, into his career so far and his progression into the into the St Kilda senior squad. So yeah, absolutely looking forward to this. 100%. And uh, Dara, I suppose, I know you, you decided to stay in Australia during the uh, the, the crisis and the pandemic, but uh, how's all over there now? Yeah, it's um, it's really good, actually. Yeah, it's starting to get back to normal. Um the other day, last weekend, like pubs and cafes started opening to small crowds again. So, um, yeah, normal life is slowly starting to resume. But uh, unfortunately, we're still under the pretty strict restrictions. Um, we're only allowed pretty much go to the supermarket and go outside for exercise and go to train and as such. Um, yeah, we're not allowed to have any guests over for dinner at the moment just because the AFL are trying to get the season kicked off. So they did that successfully last night. But uh, this is the first round of games this weekend. So. Hopefully no hiccups and they, they relax our restrictions pretty soon. 100%. I, I bet you're delighted to be back. But we'll say, obviously, with your, your season being you know temporarily shut down, you had to uh, keep training away yourselves. Were you given kind of individual training programs through the time or were you just kind of left for a bit of a break? Uh, now, we're given individual programs. So, yeah, everyone didn't really know how long it was all going to last, to be honest. Um, so the first two weeks, they kind of just said, look, kind of take it in your stride, exercise if you want to, um, because it was kind of just a big shock to the system. So I remember the, the, the last day we were at the club, everyone cleared out the gym and took as much equipment at home in their cars as they could. Um, so I kitted out the, the spare bedroom in my apartment here. So I had a pretty good setup. But um, yeah, it was just yeah, it was a bit of a weird feel. So we had two weeks of kind of doing our own thing. And then after that, then they kind of slowly ramped us up again. So they kind of treated it like an off season, but um, yeah, making sure you're you're match ready. Brilliant. And I know uh, we were talking off air there about how you decided to stay in Australia. But have you have you had much contact with the family back at home and how they're how they're getting on with the the pandemic? Yeah, no, we keep um, probably more contact than usual now because we usually just catch up once a week and. Mam and give me a ring and give me all the gossip around the Orange League, but um, yeah, no, we we catch up probably a couple of times a week on the video chat. They've had to learn how to use Zoom as well, so um, yeah. yeah, all as well back home. I think I think back home is pretty good out in the countryside, so um, they're they're busy away. You're the you're the youngest of three brothers, uh, Dara, um, Connor and Kieran, and yourself. Um, I suppose sport. I I know you from being coaching in primary school and stuff like that, but I, I know sport was a huge part of your life growing up. Yeah, it was massive. Um, the minute you go into the, the Roar National School, um, you'll probably have a hurl in your hand or a soccer ball or rugby ball or anything like that. So that's probably how you make your friends out in the countryside is through sport. And that and I probably started hurling when I was five, maybe six going around with a big helmet on my head, like a fishbowl. But um, yeah, like that's, that's where everything starts. <laughs> Especially in small villages, um, that's the whole community revolves around it. Exactly, exactly. And and your brother Kieran would have played minor and um, and under twenty one growing up. Uh, I know you were probably around nine or ten when he won that under twenty one. I learned against Tipperary in 08. It probably gave you something, you know, that you wanted to achieve yourself. It probably showed you that you know, geez, I, I'd love to have the opportunity to, to represent the Kenny someday myself. Yeah, exactly. Kieran was. Um, always every weekend we'd be going to watch him play and um yeah he was really a, a driving force in in underage teams especially with the roar and then when he was making the Kilkenny minor and going to Crow Park was it was my first time going to Crow Park and going into the stadium to see Kieran play and it was pretty surreal when I was probably nine or ten as you said so um yeah it was pretty cool watching Kieran's journey and then as he got up I remember the first day we heard that he got into the Kilkenny senior panel and Jeez, it was massive news. It was um, it was huge for us, and um, so we're just so delighted for him because you see the work that he puts in, um, away from training and that. So, uh, yeah, Kieran's journey has been very good, and he's probably lived out his childhood dream, and 
I probably wanted to, to follow suit, but then my path kind of changed a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. And before, I suppose, you you took the journey to Oz, um, you know, you, you ended up playing minor yourself for, for, for three years for the Kenny, 13, 14 and 15, and, and you won that minor A championship with, with Rohr and Stieg in 13. Uh, I know that was a massive achievement for your club, and then in 14, you went down to Captain Kilkenny in the minor. You, you had a couple of great years there, Darren, between, between that time. Yeah, my dad always says they were probably the, the best years of his life, watching everything unfold. Um, for, for the roar to win the minor was, was massive, because um, I suppose when you're growing up, like under 12, 14, 16, you come up against the city teams, and geez, we took some hockey in over the years. Um, because dad was coaching us as well, so he'd uh, coming home with his hands in his head a few times. But um, yeah, against the city teams, we always used to take a pounding. But once we got up to that under eighteen, then it was just a massive um, achievement. I remember in the semi final, we knocked over Dixborough, um, and to go on then to beat all Auckland's in the final, it was just yeah, the whole the whole town came to or village came to a standstill, and um, yeah, we celebrated hard after that one. And then the, the intermediate team then went on to win. The following week, so um, yeah, it was it was a huge huge year for the club. And then what followed then was um, yeah the honour to go on and captain to Kenny in the minors. So um, yeah, it was it was unbelievable few years and look back on them very very fondly. That's uh, that twenty fourteen year there, um, it was an unbelievable finish to the year considering what had happened to us at the start against Dublin. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't the it wasn't the ideal start. All right, I think we're still shamed for that one. Um, <laughs> was, yeah, Pat Hoven had a good song about it. All right, but um, yeah, look, it's it only what matters at the end. Um, yeah, oh, geez, I often think back on it because I was captain, and then because I was I was seventeen when I was captain, and you're kind of doubting yourself. Then Jesus, should I be? Um, do you know, sh- would the older lads be listening to me because they have another year on me and? Yeah, you kind of have these doubts, and I didn't play my best hurling that year. I thought it was better than even the year before when I was a year younger. But um, yeah, just a, it was one of those years. But geez, we came out on top, and I think Johnny Welsh um, stuck a few goals in the final. So um, yeah, incredible year. Um, yeah, one we'll never forget. It was a it, it was an incredible finish of the year, and um, you know we obviously you went up to Captain Kilkenny to, to win a minor all Ireland, something you'll. Uh, you'll cherish forever. But but one thing for me, and it's personally for yourself, is um, your brother, a couple of weeks later then, plays in the senior All-Ireland final and gets mad at the match. You know, that 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 month of September for your own house must have been so special, like, you know? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, like Dad, Dad said again, just an incredible couple of years. So we won and then the seniors drew after and that kind of, I'm not sure if it spoiled the party or probably added to the it probably added to the party because it was all about us then going back to the city west. But um, yeah, it was a weird weird type of feel. But I think we just we took the bright side of it and uh, extended our celebrations for another couple of weeks. But um, yeah, to see Kieran then come on because he didn't start the the first final and to get his chance then and yeah, it was he kind of told me I think he told me on the Tuesday night in the lead up to the game that. Um, Cody was getting them ready to hand him a tape of the Bonner Mar, and then um, I had to try and keep it a secret, which I was so excited for him. Um, <laughs> and then the, yeah, the team got named then on the on the Thursday night, I think. And yeah, you could kind of let it out then and tell everyone that you knew already. Um, but yeah, I remember traveling up on the bus because we had a bus organized with minor lads, and the whole lot of us were on Hill 16, and um. Yeah, I think uh, my brother had a bet on him to win man in a match. I think he got him at fifty to one or something like that. Um, so yeah, was, uh, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, you speak about you know growing up with hurling and the amazing achievements you had, Kenny winning all Ireland's. You know, it must have seemed like your path was fairly laid out for you in terms of hurling and, and playing with you, Kenny, and going on to senior grade, especially like a brother. But how how then does everything change? And and you might just tell us, you know, what provoked the interest in the AFL and how that move to Australia came about? Yeah, so obviously I went to, to school in Go Council in New Ross and um, it's a pretty big football stronghold down there. Uh, I love going down there because, well, Kieran and Connor went there as well um, and Kieran is quite a good footballer himself. So I wanted to go there and play football because I always enjoyed it in primary school. Um, and then, um, yeah, we just we were quite successful <laughs> growing up 
14, 16. And then I think I was 16 years of age when I first got um, a phone call. Um, well, I didn't get the phone. It was actually Mam got the phone call. Um, I think Mick Dempsey had some as a contact uh, with Hawthorne because he was down in Australia doing a bit of study here a couple of years back. Um, so he got me first in contact with Hawthorne. And then it was just, yeah, casual catch up in the Phoenix Park. Um, showed me a footy, showed me how to kick it, how to handball, the basic skills. Um, and then it kind of developed then for a few months. I think he came back to Australia. Uh, he was over testing a few boys. And then, um, yeah, it was just kind of Skype calls. Um, me sending me on some footage of them, me of me playing football. Um, and then, yeah, it kind of went from there. And it didn't work out with Hawthorne. Um, but then I got invited to the the camp in the testing camp in DCU, uh, and I kind of went from there. Then um, tested tested at DCU and all the physical tests they go through everything they do, um, the beep test, uh, agility, speed, all that psychological testing, um, and then yeah, the main the main bit though is they just throw your footy and see how you can handle it. So um, yeah, I was kind of lucky in a way that I got shown how to kick it back when I was 16 so this is a couple of years later now I was 18 at the testing in DCU um, so yeah I kind of knew how to kick it roughly so I kind of stood out a little bit from everyone else because I had a little head start on them and um, yeah we used to watch it me and my brothers used to watch it on the, um, the highlights on TG Cahar years back when they used to show it and we used to always enjoy it so um, mm -hmm. yeah it kind of it was, it was very new to me but I kind of embraced every opportunity I had of it you know, you speak. You were speaking there about, we'll say, uh, at fifteen, you know, being shown the basic skills. Uh, did you then spend, we'll say, kind of a couple of years, kind of practicing on 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 the QT, or did you kind of practice on the kicking stuff? Did you always kind of have the idea that you would go? Uh it was probably very early days back then. Um, I was kind of kicking it for fun more so. Um, I used to before before I got handed the footy, I used to have a rugby ball and. I kind of watched a bit on YouTube and tried to kick it with a rugby ball, and then they sent me over a few Sharons. So um, yeah, it was there was no real plan behind it or long term plan. They just said they were interested in to kind of track my progress because at sixteen you're too young to to go across for any testing because they kind of have it above eighteen now. Um, but yeah, I kind of enjoyed the thought of it. But um, hurling was definitely the forefront of my mind, especially with the minor and that. Yeah, hurling and, and Gaelic football in school kind of was taken over. You, you made the switch, you know, as an international rookie before 2017. Talk to me about your first couple of years then in, in St Kilda. You were playing in the uh, the VFL with Sandringham? Yeah, so first couple of years, yeah, my very first year... Um, I play. I think I played 14 games in the in the VFL. Uh, I played a couple in the development as well. So my first year, I struggled. It doesn't seem like it on telly when you're watching, but there's a hell of a lot of structure and getting your head around it. So um, yeah, there's a hell of a lot to it. Um, and then yeah, trying to deal with the ball itself because it's it's a, it's a devil of a ball if it rolls away. From you. Yeah. Um, nice. But yeah, there's so much to it, especially as a defender. And I play a uh, key defender. So there's just a lot of like body contact and little subtle uh, differences to hurling that you're not allowed to do in hurling, but like you're kind of, yeah, very subtle body movements and that, especially when you're up against the big boys to be able to shift their body weight. And I yeah, struggle now very, um, very hard in my first year. And then when you're struggling with football, you kind of get homesick because you're over here for football and it's your job. Um, and when that's not good, when you're just, Job's not going good. You know, you know, I was looking for home. Um, I was very close to, to pulling the trigger on a few flights when I was. I'd walk past the flight centre over here, and I'd be looking in to see how much it is back to Europe. Um, but yeah, yeah I kind of stuck it out. Um, and uh, yeah, my first year, then I I did struggle, but I played a few games, and it was a learning curve. Um, and my second year, then I just came back and. I kind of knew what everything was all about. I knew what was ahead of me in pre-season. So I came back flying fit, um, ready to go. And yeah, I kind of hit the ground running then and put myself into contention for um, a debut uh, in my second year. It's brilliant, brilliant. And, and I suppose, Dara, from working with you before, one of the biggest things I would say about you is that you were always 
willing to learn, that you were always willing to evolve and, and constantly learn. And I've no doubt it was the same when you went to Australia. But uh, can you give us an insight into your uh, training schedule? Like, What's your day-to-day -day routine like in Australia? Yeah, probably different because there's two very different parts of the year. There's a pre-season, there's a hell of a lot of training. So um, the pre-season schedule probably looked like main days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They'd be your big days where you'd get in. So on a Monday morning, you'd probably get in at 7 o'clock in the morning, um, get your physio and strapping and massage all done because you have to strap your ankles before every session because, you know, there's, you, get, you jump in the air, but you can get contact in the air, so they're always scared of a rolled ankle. Um, so you get all that done in the morning. Then you'd probably have your team meeting around 8 o'clock, um, probably go for an hour because they start implementing the game plan as the preseason goes on and what you want to work on. Um, then from nine o'clock, then you probably have a half an hour to get yourself ready, um, movement prep. Um, yeah, just to get the body feeling good and be ready to hit the ground running the minute you get out in the field. Then in the midst of preseason, come December, January, you could be out on the field for up to three hours. Um, there, there are big sessions and probably 12 to 14 kilometers in a session. Um, so that'll be the main session um come off the track then and you'd get your your ice baths and your recovery and your more massage um then you you get your lunch and then you have your weight session in the afternoon so um some days there you might get in at seven and you might leave till five o'clock in the evening um because you'd have different meetings in the afternoon and catching up with your development coach and then you have to do extra touch in the afternoon as well so they can be long days um then on a Tuesday, then we'd um, kind of have an extra conditioning session. So we could start at 7 a.m. in the pool. Could be swimming a kilometer to 1.5 kilometers in the pool. Um, and then we used to, the, my first couple of years, we used to do boxing sessions. Um, just extra conditioning, off legs, stuff that gets you fit, but it doesn't tax your legs. Um, and then, so that was, when we used to do boxing my first couple of years. And then the last couple of years, we've been doing wrestling. Uh, kind of jiu-jitsu just to get the body used to tackling and get the neck right um so they're, very, they're tough sessions so then a wednesday is another main session thursday be day off friday another main session and then saturday be kind of a weight session just in the morning for a few hours and you'd have the weekend off then after that but um yeah you probably so you have three main pitch sessions you probably have four gym sessions during the week two leg sessions two upper body sessions and then extra conditioning around that. So you jam jam a lot into your week and then away from it in pre-season on your day off and that you're you're probably so wrecked that you just want to sleep all day so um, and just get ready for the next one. Uh, and then in season then, so we're getting ready for games now, we probably have a light session on a Monday, um, uh, just build up then on, the, on a Wednesday or Thursday, whichever, depending on what day our game is on. Um, and then into the game. So in season is more about just preparing for. We treat it as like a marathon on the weekend, and then you have to come down from that, get yourself ready, get all the the niggles and that sorted out before you go again on the weekend. So, um, the games are 120 minutes long. So, um, yeah, you're probably tracking up to some lads are hitting 14, 15 kilometers in a game, um, with bumps and bruises as well. So, it's just kind of about recovery and maintenance during the season. Fair play. And, and, and tell us, um, Dara, in terms of, you spoke about gameplay there, um, the tactical side of the game, is there much um, involved in that side where you're working on gameplay and how you want to play the game? Yeah, there's a massive amount. Um, I'm probably lucky in a sense that I just swing between being a defender and forward. So I kind of, I'm a swing man, so I jump forward every now and then. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd hate to be in the midfield because the midfielders have to deal with so much. And uh, I listen, I've tuned into a few of the meetings, but it's it's um, it's nonsense. What I uh, make sense of it. Um, yeah, there's so much structure and flow to the game. But um, yeah, as a defend, because your in your positioning on the field can impact so much of what's happening up the field. So as a defender. Because they, they call it a game at 360. So as a defender, you know, you can defend your man from any position, being in front of him, behind him, beside him, or anything like that. But you, your positioning can dictate what your man 50 metres up the ground does with the ball. So 
Um, we've had a couple of different coaches the last couple of years come in, so different coaches want to implement their own different uh, styles of play. Um, so, yeah, you have to transition to that as well. But, um, yeah, there's, there's so much involved um, and structure. But then there's a certain amount. Our new coach this year now is just kind of saying there's starting positions for structure, but after that, go play. So these lads have grown up with the game all their lives like we did with hurling at home. So there's a certain amount where you just want to use your instinct and go play. Very good, very good. And, and, and like your position, you, you say there you're a key defender. I'm sure mentoring from the likes of uh, Jay Carlisle and Nathan Brown, They've given you plenty of guidance and how to play the position. But, but what was the skill set you needed to work on, Daryl, when you got over there? Yeah, it was probably like I talked about earlier. It was probably just the subtle body movements of your opponent because you can just dictate. So as a key defender, it's not really about racking up 20 disposals with the ball or anything like that or getting so many kicks. It's just about stopping your man, really. So um, I kind of I struggled with it at the start because... You know, I've kind of grown up hurling and I've kind of always been in positions where I'm always in the mix, whether centre-back, midfield or centre-forward. Um, whether transitioning to a game where you're not really involved in the game, but you're just kind of stopping your man. I found that mentally a hard, a hard switch. But then I just had to think about it. It's a professional sport. You look at NFL, there's, there's lads getting paid in NFL just to push blokes out of the way and not touch the ball at all. So I kind of had to make a little mental switch like that. Um, so, yeah, it's just the little intricacies of body positioning and how you can dictate your phone and how you can stop him and shift him underneath the ball, um, which I found very difficult because at hurling, of course, you're, you're not like pushing the back or, you know, it has to be shoulder on shoulder contact um, to hit him a good one. But uh, here you can just, yeah, you can use your body a, a lot more. It's more physical. Very good, excellent, excellent. And and I, I know um we'll touch on it later on when you when you played in twenty eighteen and you made your debut, but one thing that struck me from from videos of that is there's a great togetherness among your team. There's a great spirit among your team. I'd say the culture within the club Dara is it's a, it's a special place to be involved in. Yeah, absolutely. Um I yeah, I found it hard because there's a lot of high five and bumps happening and that kind of thing over here, which you don't which you don't get at the hurling. Um so it's all about kind of getting around and creating energy because you know, you're doing the same pretty much the same thing every week. So you're doing this pretty much the same warm up and that. So it can get monotonous. So you have to just kind of think of new ways to to create energy and get everyone up and about. Um but yeah, the culture of the club is you're going to the club is obviously trying to improve each year. So um, there's new people coming in. And this year, we've really struck with a good balance of um, creating a, a culture and new people have come in and with new ideas and that. So, um, yeah, it's a great place to be. And it's a real family environment um, because my, my parents absolutely love coming down here because they're made feel so welcome when they come into the club and that. So, um, yeah, it's a real family-orientated club and it's uh, fantastic to be a part of. And and say there, like you've built a new, I know the club have built a new forty million headquarters. Um, we'd say you know they've state of the art. Can you give us an idea as to what what that complex entails? I, I've no doubt it's 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 something uh, so, something unique, you know. Yeah, it's an incredible place now. Um, so obviously the main parts that we we'd use would probably be the gym. It's a state of the art gym. It's um massive is two tiers so you have your kind of off legs bike area upstairs and then all your gym and weights equipment downstairs um there's a full basketball court um where we do a lot of indoor touch and have rebound nets and that um so spend a fair bit of time in there and then yeah everything we need in our changing rooms ice baths there's spas everything you need there's massage rooms the physios have their own place the doctor has his own place um lunch areas yeah everything you can think of and then um a lot of like at the end of the day it's a business so you have all your hr and all your um yeah your finance people down the other end of the building um it's pretty quiet at the moment because a lot of people are not allowed to work in in there anymore it's pretty much strictly players so there's um yeah it's pretty much 60 people now allowed in there there's the 45 players and uh, a certain amount of staff so it's a big building now with just only the the sports people in there 
which is a bit bizarre, but yeah, state of the art building, and when everyone gets back to work, it'll um, it takes over very well. Uh, excellent, excellent, fair play. And uh, you just you you talk about there, I would say the the intense, would say the intensity of your your training schedule, and you know the precision and the detail of your training routine, and and what you're going over. You know, obviously, there's a huge difference, I'd imagine, between, we'll say, the professional and amateur setup of the GA compared to, 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 to things over there. Yeah, look, there is, there is a fair difference because, like, at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. We're here to perform on the weekend and get ourselves to our physical and mental best um, to perform each week. Um, so, like, I can go home during the day after a session and and have a 40 minute nap or whatever I want to do during the day and um, I'm having you know there's food laid on for me after training that I can get into me straight away and all the recovery supplements you need everything's laid on for you so you're getting two massages a week which um, I'm sure the JA boys would love at home so like when I first came over I just thought how good is this you're spoiled for choice here um, but it just really it really sets home what the GA lads do at home, like what I've seen Kieran and Connor do for so many years there. Um, I did myself with the minor, you know, you'd, you'd um, finish school at four o'clock and um, Joe Pike would come down and collect us in the car and head up to minor training. And then, like, I wouldn't get home till 10 o'clock and then have to do the do the homework um, on the bus into school the next morning. So what the GA lads do at home is, is incredible. And, um, yeah, they're the performance they output is is fascinating but um you know that's that's why the Australian lads come over to Ireland and take athletes because they know of the the athletes potential so that's why there's I think there's nearly 17 of us down here at the moment so um yeah it's mm-hmm. uh, it's fascinating what the, the lads do at home and you know just even kind of having having been involved in both I can imagine it's an amazing setup to be a part of you know Having that experience, then what kind of is there any one aspect would we'll say from the AFL and your time over in Australia that you'd love to bring back to the GAA? You know, if you could, if you could get the chance, or uh, you know, what would you add to the GAA? Uh, I I don't know because the J I don't know the J is so special in itself. You'd obviously you'd love to reward lads by paying them to do what they love, um. But I think that it just would ruin the J at home, um. I don't know. I think the J is just such a a special thing at the moment. And you play for where you grow up and where you love. Um, it's probably not something that I bring home, but something that's different to the J that's over here is you know some lads just take it as a job and clock out and go home straight away. And you know they don't really love the job, but they're just kind of gifted because they have the right body shape or they're they're pretty good at it. Um, and they don't uh, they kind of take it for granted as such so that's what I just love about the J that there's no egos involved and it's not about pay because you know some lads over here are, are big 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 paychecks and um, yeah just because they might be lucky because they're seven foot tall or something like that so there's nothing really I'd, I'd bring home to change about the J I think it's very special and I think that's why we all love it at home Fantastic. But just even for yourself then, your, you know, your hard work paid off. Uh, you made your AFL debut against Melbourne. I think it was in round 15 of the 2018 season. That must have been a really uh, special achievement for yourself after, after making the move and all the hard work. Yeah, that was, um, that was a massive moment. It was probably up there with the, the, minor, the minor final lifting the cup. Um, it's just, yeah, when you get down in the MCG, it's, it's like a coliseum when you walk in. It's just, it's a massive massive uh, stadium and um, yeah my mum got to travel down for it as well so kind of one of the a very special moment was getting my jersey presented and she was there to see it and I got to give her a hug and a kiss after it so um, yeah they're incredible memories but um, yeah I suppose probably all the hard work paid off because I, like I said I struggled in my first year um, and then knuckled down in my second year and I was kind of persistent and persistent all year I was very close to getting in earlier um, I'd been named emergency a few times, which is kind of the, the next player in if anyone got injured or sick. Um, so that probably went on for six or seven weeks. And I thought, would my time ever come? But when it did, um, yeah, I was I was really grateful for it. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed the opportunity. And then uh, after you make that breakthrough uh, in 2018, you get offered a new two-year contract. Uh, I suppose the big challenge now or you're looking forward to driving it on with St Kilda and, and, and giving it a, another go yeah exactly it's just about um, 
yeah, it's just about knuckling down now and keep persisting. We've obviously taken in, uh, taken in a few new recruits this year. So your team is obviously trying to get better each year. Um, so they brought in some big name players from different clubs this year. So um, competition for spots is, is really heating up at the moment. So I think there's, there's four lads being dropped um, from round one for this weekend. So it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's really hot at the moment and the, out there. So um, you kind of have to just make every training session count. So probably a bit frustrating that I'm injured at the moment and everyone else is pretty fit. Um, but yeah, you just kind of you you work your arse off and um, knuckle down and kind of get in there and just hopefully cement a spot when you can. Fantastic. And even just from my own perspective, my own interest. Um, obviously, evidently, you want to carve a career out for yourself in the AFL, and I've no doubt you will. But do St Kilda then do they provide a kind of a college education or a way for players to you know further a career for themselves when the AFL is finished? Yeah, so we've got a player development manager, and he's um. Yeah, he's they really value uh, doing something outside of the club because, like I said, it's it's your job over here and it can really consume you. But we do have a lot of free time because you can't train all the time. So they do um they do put a lot of focus on doing something outside of the club. So I've been getting my um my fitness courses ticked off. So I've been uh, a qualified personal trainer the last couple of years. So I've got that ticked off. Um. But yeah, different lads are doing different things. Some lads are doing a trade on their day off. Like they'll go to the building site and um, do a do a little bit of that. Uh, different lads are studying different units in school, in college. So um, yeah, there's a big emphasis on that because it kind of takes your mind off football, especially if it's not going your way and you're not in the side or something like that. It's just something else that can take your mind off it. Great stuff, Dara. And I suppose... Um Life in Australia, away from the, the, the football and away from the AFL with St Kilda, uh, what's life in, like, like in Australia? Are you enjoying yourself over there? Yeah, look, I'm loving it down here. Um, it's a probably a very different culture back home and obviously the climate's a bit different. Um, summertime is, is amazing down here. It's, uh, it's 35 to 40 degrees most days. Um, sometimes it can be too hot, but... Yeah, I'm so lucky where I live. I'm right near the beach um, in a place called Bright Nice. So, um, yeah, I'm just loving it. It's a real just outdoors country. Um, you go down Beach Road at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's like the Tour de France and um, so many people out running and swimming and everything. So, yeah, look, I love it down here. It's a, a great place and the people are, people are very friendly. And I've no doubt Australia, you know, you've... You watch anything online they're a huge um, sporting nation we'd say in your spare time Dara do you, do you get to play a bit of golf do you watch any other sports over there yeah I love my golf um, I before the Covid and all I used to get out at least once a week anyway um, there's a there's a big golf uh, culture at the club so um, we love getting out um, apart from that look Melbourne is always kind of buzzing with sport there's Come January, there's um, the tennis, there's the Grand Prix after that, um, then footy, the NRL, rugby union starts. So, um, yeah, it's just the uh, sport mad. Um, and it's, Melbourne is probably like Kilkenny at home at Hurling. It's just footy mad as well. Um, different parts of Australia are not so inclined. Like Sydney is kind of more rugby based um, and they only have two clubs up there in AFL. But... Melbourne have 12 clubs here and it's just you can't get away from footy it's 24-7 on the TV there's a dedicated radio station TV channel um, yeah it's all everyone ever talks about so you can imagine what's happening down here now at the moment with footy restarting after um, the, the pandemic Excellent, excellent and I suppose towards the future uh, I've no doubt you want to stay in St Kilda carve out a career for yourself but um Will we ever see you in the Roar and Steve or Kenny jersey again? Oh, look, it's, uh, I'd absolutely love to. Um, it's kind of been unfortunate. The times I have gone home in the off-season, um, each year I've kind of been injured or had a niggle, um, which I couldn't really ask for permission to play. Um, different lads get away with playing Gaelic, I suppose, coming home. But... Yeah, when you try and explain hurling to them or show hurling on a video over here, <laughs> they think it's a bit barbaric. So um, I'd have to be in the good books to, to let the coach let me play at home. Yeah. But um, yeah, I definitely won't rule it out. I'd um, like 
uh, Aussie rules wasn't my dream growing up. It was always a dream to play hurling for Kilkenny. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't rule it out. That's for sure. Uh, great, great, great. Well, listen, Dara, just to finish up our interview, we're just going to have a bit of a quick fire round with you. It's just for a bit of fun. Uh, we do with all our guests on the show, and um, we'd like to do it with you today, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, three, two, one. Your favourite hurler? Uh, Tommy Welsh. Your favourite stadium you've played in? Uh, Crow Park or else Marvel Stadium down here. It has the roof closed, so it'd be pretty cool if you got a hurling game in there. <laughs> Your favourite food? Uh, it has to be breakfast. I'm a breakfast man, so eggs on toast with a bit of avocado. Very good, very good. Rugby or soccer? Rugby. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Cody or Hoven? <laughs> <laughs> It'd have to be Hoven for his uh, post game antics with the guitar. <laughs> All Ireland Hurling Champions 2020 and the Football Champions 2020. Uh, Kilkenny for the hurling, and since it's the year that's in it and it's been crazy so far, I'll have to go Mayo for the football. Fair play, Jeez. fair play. <laughs> <laughs> one, <laughs> one, one sporting occasion you'd love to go to? Uh, the Rugby World Cup final. Very good. One thing you miss about Ireland? Uh, uh, getting together on a Sunday evening with the family the whole time. Great stuff. So final one. Uh, your favourite podcast? It has to be the extended panel, Eric. <laughs> Fair play to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> well, Dara, it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have had the opportunity uh, to talk to you this morning. I'd be very lucky to get the chance to get to work with you when you were playing minor hurling with Kenny. Um, you know, you always had a fantastic work, work ethic and attitude. I've always admired your, your steel determination and what you put your mind to. Uh, always wanting to be better and get the very best out of yourself. Um, look, I wish you the very best luck in your AFL career and whatever the future holds. Um, thanks again for taking the time for talking to us this morning, for catching up, and uh, all the best for the future. And we, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, sir. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, great chat. Thank you. Well, that's it for today, folks. Thanks again to Dara Joyce for a brilliant interview, and we'd like to wish him all the best in the remainder of his season with St Kilda. Check out our Instagram and Twitter at Extended Panel to find out who will be coming up on next weekend's show. Uh, until then, take it easy, and we'll see you next Sunday with a brand new episode.